Hello, everybody. Um, forgive my voice. I am homesick with the COVID. Um, but so it's good that I'm home and not around anybody, but I'm gonna do the quick introduction and then turn it over to Rhonda. Um, but I'll be here for tech problems or questions. I'll just turn off my camera um, and mute myself because you do not want to hear my snottiness. So um, you have, if you did not intend to be in Finding Family Facts, that's where you have landed yourself today. Um, this is a program of the Cows Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, the programs and website coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. The Roberts Library is located at 401 President Clinton Avenue in downtown Little Rock. That's in the River Market District across Rock Street from the main library. I'm admitting people as I'm doing this intro, so that's why I kind of have to pause. Um, the Roberts Library Research Room is open Tuesday through Friday from 10 until 5 and every Saturday from noon until 4. The Roberts Library and Butler Center for Arkansas Studies has an extensive collection of genealogical reference materials. This includes books, microfilm, and other print resources. Um, they're part of our non-circulating collection at the library, so you must come to Roberts to use them. We also have computers for you to do genealogical research on databases like Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com. But we also, the, I think the biggest thing is our genealogists that we have on staff that can help you really pinpoint what you're looking for. So most of the databases that we'll refer to on this and other Finding Family Facts programs um, are available for use at any CALS branch. So if you're tuning in outside of the Central Arkansas or outside of the Central Arkansas Library System service area, check with your local library. My guess is that they have subscriptions to databases like Ancestry.com and Newspapers.com, HeritageQuest, all of these databases um, that you're going to hear about. So a couple of quick announcements. First of all, Please save the date, or now just go register. October 1st will be our annual genealogical workshop, genealogy workshop, at the Ron Robinson Theater in Library Square. It's an all-day workshop with a guest speaker, Lori Thornton, who's from the Knoxville Tri-Cities area in Tennessee. The workshop will be hybrid, and participants will be able to attend in person or virtually via, via Zoom. But this workshop will not be recorded. You won't be able to see it again. So you either have to be there in person on October 1st, or you have to attend via Zoom on October 1st. So it's kind of important to register. I'll put the link to that um, in the chat here in just a minute. Also the DIY, well, before I say this, on this, October's Finding Family Facts, which is supposed to be, would, would have been on October 10th or 12th, the second Monday of the month. I think it's actually the 12th. We will not have Finding Family Facts next Oct in October next month. That is um, Cal's staff day. And we all take the day to do some training. And so all Cal's buildings will be closed. So we will meet again in November. Okay, so now the DIY Memory Lab is open Tuesday through Friday from 10.15 to 4.30 p.m. Appointments are required, and we would like you to attend one of our personal archiving classes before using the Memory Lab. So we have both a flatbed scanner station and an AV station. So the flatbed scanner station, um, you can scan photos up to 11 by 14, mounted slides, and film negatives. The AV station, you can digitize your VHS, your beta, and your audio cassettes. I do want to point out, because we're getting lots of questions about this, we do not have a way for you to digitize VHS and beta and audio onto a CD or DVD. That's actually not a recommended method, so you have to put it on an external hard drive or the cloud. Um, but we've gotten a lot of questions in the last week about that. We do not have a burning station for DVD or CD. So appointments are also available for the Memory Lab on Saturdays, but you'll need to contact me directly 
um, about Saturday appointments. And again, I'll put all of this in the chat. Okay, so now for the real reason that you're here, Rhonda Stewart, the Butler Center's local history and genealogy specialist is gonna give an overview of genealogy and then she's gonna take questions. So she's the real program. So let me share my screen. Okay. All right. And okay. So can you see, is it on your full screen, Rhonda? It is. Okay. Okay. So Thank I'm going to disappear now, but I'm here if you need me and I'll advance slides when you tell me. Okay. Good afternoon. I am Rhonda Stewart. I am the genealogy and local history specialist for the Central Arkansas Library Systems Butler Center for Arkansas Studies housed in the Bobby L. Roberts Library Building. Long night, because we do a lot of stuff in here. Uh, thank you for joining today's presentation. <laughs> and I say that laughingly because I still don't like doing these, but that's okay. I'm here, I'm gonna do it to the best of my abilities and uh, we'll go from there. Um, I get quite a few questions about what is genealogy? How do you know if you're looking at the right information and da 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 da. So I put together this little short presentation. I think it's short anyway. I thought it was kind of cute because it came to me like during the middle of a football game yesterday. And I was like, oh, that'd be all right. Let me write that down. So <clears throat> the genealogy is a gathering of information. It just happens to be a gathering of information on your people, your family, your relatives, your ancestors, whatever you want to label the people around you that created you. It is a gathering of information about these people. Question is, what is your theory? Do you think you know who they are? Do you know you know who they are? Or would you like to know who they are? And what can you prove? And proof is everything. Do you have the records to back up what you're saying? And records can include all kinds of things. Um, evidence, that's what a record is. Yeah, you can go ahead to that next slide, uh, Heather. Evidence, that's what we're looking for is evidence. And I came up with these, this definition of evidence. Each view independently directs everyone, need clues, examine. Go back one, yeah. Each view independently directs everyone, need clues, examine. That's your evidence. If I can take what you're looking at and come to the same conclusion that you came to, then it's evidence. If I can take what you're looking at and say, nope, you got all this wrong, this is not does not match, that puzzle piece does not fit, then that's evidence. But I have to have some strong evidence to dispute what you put down, because a lot of what I know about your family is small compared to what you know about your family. So you may have some oral history, but grandmama said this, and granddaddy said that, or my Aunt June said this, or my Aunt Shirley said that. So depends on whose evidence you're looking at, how uh, serious the evidence is, where did you get the evidence, can you find it again if you need to find it? Is it bookmarked somewhere? Is it footnoted somewhere? Where did you get your evidence? And can I go find the evidence that you use to decide this is the family that you're researching and you connect to all of these people? So finding the evidence is very important. That's the one thing we wanna do because we can argue all day long, but if I got evidence, and you can't dispute my evidence with your evidence, then I win the game. And a lot of times it's all about that. Remember, those of you with siblings, how'd you win? You proved them wrong, or you got the best of them in a fight. Either way, you had the evidence. I'm better than you, or I'm smarter than you, or whichever it was. Because with siblings especially, there's always that competition about what, who knows what, especially if, like, I have a brother who's literally a year and two days uh, uh, older than me and growing up I was like <laughs> I'm still smarter than you and then he proved it because he got put back a year and so I really had evidence that I was smarter than him because I didn't get put back he did so that evidence is important when you look at that family and when you're trying to understand what was going on in your family uh next slide please <laughs> my brother's gonna kill me for that but that's okay <laughs> we go to that next slide Gauging information. When was the record made? Who created the record? 
Was it an individual? Was it a government? Uh, was it a school? You know, who made that record? And is there supporting documentation? And when I'm talking about gauging information, that's when you get to decide how strong or how weak your evidence is. If it is a birth record, that's a pretty hard piece of evidence. Uh, if it is a rumor, mm, that's a soft piece of evidence. Could have a lot of truth to it, but it's still soft. Uh, if I found out where you got baptized at the age of two, that's a pretty strong piece of evidence. You're written down in the church somewhere, the documents, whatever. That's pretty good evidence. So we're gauging the information, where it came from, how strong is it, what's the likelihood that it is correct and that it was written down at the time that it says it was written down and somebody didn't come back later and say, well, I'm just going to make this book up or I'm going to write this book or I'm going to make this story that I'm going to sell to somebody so I'm going to fill in the gaps or when this happened, this happened and this happened only to find out it didn't quite happen then. Like if your person's age is off by 10 to 20 years, you may be looking at a different generation, maybe somebody with the same name. So you want to gauge your information uh, pretty much like those of you that are into uh, uh, movies or television shows about law and order or evidence collecting or things like that. Think about that when you're doing the genealogy. Does it fit the puzzle that you're trying to put together? The evidence that you have, does it work in a reasonable way to make a full picture of the people you are researching? So we're gauging the information. That next slide, please. hard evidence, how all relatives drink. And that's a slight look at my personality because some people would look at that and say, she talking about hard liquor or beer or what? I'm talking about water, how everybody has to have water. If you do not have water, you do not exist. So hard evidence is like knowing everybody has to have water in order to live. And so when we look for hard evidence, we want to look at uh, things that we know will not change just because our attitude changed or because the person we looked at gave somebody a lie. We want to find the hard, cold facts of their life. The next slide, please. There's some universal truths. Water is life. Humanity is common. Air is necessary. And emotions are shared. Water is life. Again, you cannot exist without water. And um, as a child, I used to argue, well, I didn't argue with it, but I would propose to my mother that everything was made of water. So I was really drinking water, even if it was just Kool-Aid or Coca-Cola or some other juice. It was made out of water was my argument. So I was drinking water. The older you get, the more you realize that does not fly. <laughs> Should have realized it as a child. But the purer the water, the more clear the water, the more perfect the water, the better it is for you. If you switch water up by adding that little tablet that changes the color, the Kool-Aid color, then you're not drinking water. You change the composition of the water. So water is life. That's a universal truth. Humanity is common. I don't care who you are on this earth. Most of us do not have three or four limbs that don't belong to us. We have two arms. We have two legs. We have a body. We have a head. That's basically all you get. And so if you look at life that way, that's a hard universal truth. When you're looking for hard evidence, is the person you, you're uh, researching, not talking about amputees or those born with limited or, or, or without a limb. I'm talking about common humanity. Most of us have the basic functions of our body. We have that arm, that leg, that head, the feet to get around on sometimes. Maybe they don't work like they should, but we all were born with them or had access to it at one point or another. Air is necessary. <laughs> Can't say that better now with COVID still going around also. Air is very necessary. That's a hard truth about life. The people you are researching at one time did breathe air. They were alive walking this earth. Even if they're gone 100 years, 200 years, they were alive at one point on this earth. 
so that air is necessary. So when you're thinking about the folks you're researching, think about the air that they were breathing. What was the location? Who else was breathing in the air around them? Can you go there now and soak in some of that same atmosphere, that air in the location that they had lived 100, 200 years ago? And for the most part, you can, as long as you adhere to these universal truths and you find evidence that supports this is the person that you are connected to and that you could actually go to where they were born or where they died or where they lived the most part of their life. And you can go there and walk around and see some of the same things they saw because buildings sometimes will last for hundreds or thousands of years. Definitely trees. If you got a big oak tree on the uh, plot of land that your family owned in 1900, I guarantee you somebody's DNA from your family is on that oak tree somewhere. So we are connected and we find the universal truths, the evidence that connects us all. And emotions are shared. Emotions are that universal truth that you kind of look at a little differently because where well, everything else is pretty static, water, air, humanity, emotions are not static. They can go any way, every way, all kinds of ways. And so a truth to emotions is we all have them. A truth is that we all share them. And sometimes they are not received in the way that we share them. And sometimes we have a reaction to the way they are shared, but emotions are always there. So when you're looking at your ancestors, uh, I like to say, consider some of the folks you know right now that are related to you. Because somebody's acting like somebody acted 100 years ago. Uh, I'm thinking of a cousin of mine who was very loving, very friendly, always making friends anywhere she went, always willing to talk to someone. Uh, but she had a habit of cursing people out. And those in the family that she did not curse out, she really cared for. And she would ask them, did I ever curse you out? I didn't ever curse you out. I must like you. And that was her way of approaching people sometimes. And again, that emotions, the emotions of getting cursed out or not getting cursed out by this specific relative, sometimes hurt people's feelings. She never cursed me out. I'm like, why are you mad about that? Why are you upset about that? Cause she didn't curse me out. She don't love me. Well, you got it flipped. If she didn't curse you out, it's because she really cared about you. If she cursed you out, that cause that's because you irritated her in some kind of way, and she had to let her let you know. And that was the way she shared her emotions was by cursing you out. Well, it turns out our grandfather had a sister that was very similar in personality to this cousin of mine, because um, she liked to curse people out too. I tell people my first language was profanity because I learned to curse before I learned to talk because I was around that language. But it wasn't in a negative way. A lot of times that was the way they expressed themselves. Uh, no matter who they were mad at or not mad at, the beauty of it is they use profanity in a way that expressed how they were feeling and is, was not directed, especially directly at you sometimes, it was the way it was directed at your actions and not you as a person. So when you're thinking about your family, again, think about who you know right now. And then as you find the evidence of those from your past, imagine how that person may have reacted to one of your relatives today or how similar they may be to the one of, one of your relatives today. Because a lot of times those personalities will pop up in different generations uh, and you'll find evidence of it. Like uh, if you're a school teacher and you come in and you find out that uh, one of your relatives back in 1910 was a school teacher and nobody had ever told you that because that information got lost through generations or whatnot. So you'll find that connection with that relative. That's a universal truth. And sometimes it shows up in the record. Sometimes it shows up just on the personalities of the family members around us today. Let's go to that next slide, please. Soft evidence. Again, I'm just, I was watching a football game yesterday and I was playing around with some words. Soft evidence, some opinions feel tricky. And the reason I say that is because, first of all, we're talking about opinions, not uh, firm, hard evidence. And opinions are things that we cannot totally prove. Like um, I can say there are more brown eyed people in my family than blue-eyed people. 
Can I prove that? No, because I don't have the data to back it up. And I don't have the evidence that says, okay, Rhonda, you're related to all these people with blue eyes on this side and all these people with brown eyes on this side. So you got more brown eyed people than blue eyed people because I'm brown eyed. I might think that's true, but it may not be because we all connect to so many different people. Like I said, just going back four generations, you, be, you should be researching 15 different couples that came together to create you. Had either one of those couples not come together, you would not be here. And what if those 15 couples all had blue eyes except for one? And that's the one you get your brown eyes from. Something to think about. Again, this is soft evidence. Some opinions feel tricky. Me, I would think uh, most of my folks got brown eyes, but just on the records that I've verified in my family tree, that shade of brown can be very, very different depending on who's describing it. Um, those anywhere from the lightest of browns to the darkest of browns to where it's called black sometimes. But again, that's soft evidence. That's evidence that you know is there, but you can't quite swear that this is definitely true of all the people in my family or most of the people in my family. It's soft evidence. Let's go to the next slide, please. So you make educated guesses. An educated guess is a guess to the best of your ability. Odds are, if you're a gambling person, there's nine chances out of 10 that this is correct. Or there's more than 50% chance that I am correct in my assumption that this is the correct family that I'm following and these are the members and I didn't miss anybody and da 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 da. Educated guess. Connections of household members. When you look at a census record and it tells you that first name is that head of the household and then each name below that is the person that connects to that household member, the head of the household. It may be a spouse, it could be a parent, could be a child could be a lodger as they're described sometimes or a renter or a roommate we would say today or a grandchild or a great grandchild or a godchild, all kinds of labels that describe families today, describe families back in the day. So when we're guessing, educated guessing, we look at the connections of the household members. If that person is listed as the spouse to the head of the household, you want to go prove that you want to find that marriage record or divorce record or any kind of record that connects those two people together legally. Um, if they're not together legally, you want to look to see well, how long have they been together? You know, they're living as a husband and wife or spouse and spouse, partner, whatever label you want to put on it. How long have they been living together like that? And you want to look for death records because death records give you all kinds of information including the name of the informant. And if the person that died, died before their spouse or partner, and their partner or spouse is the one that gave the information on the death certificate, then it also gives you information about their relationship. It will tell you wife, brother, cousin, friend, whatever their connection is, most times on a death certificate, it will tell you that. So that helps you with your educated guess. Relationships with neighbors. <laughs> Think about your neighbors today, and I say that laughing because we are so not neighborly in my eyes sometimes today. A lot of times we're in an, in, in an area where we barely know our neighbors, if we know our neighbors, and speaking to them may be on again, off again type of deal, or it may never happen. But in earlier times, when we were researching our ancestors, Following that neighbor sometimes helps you know more about your family member. Because if you look at the migratory pattern of the United States, a lot of times people shifted their location, not by themselves, but with a group of people. And a lot of times they came from the same area and went to the same area or spread out along that path to different areas. So if I found my relative in 1910, living in Little Rock, Arkansas, and then in 1920, they're living in Chicago, Illinois. I also want to look at the other people around them on that same census record and maybe track a couple of those people, especially if they're in the same age group, 
and see if they went to the same location. Um, when it came to the two wars, World War I, World War II, it gives us a lot of information. If you find your great, great uncle on a World War I draft registration card, look to see if his neighbors are also registered for the draft, and then look to see if they all end up in the same area or going to the same locations after the war, because they may have moved from, again, Little Rock to Detroit to go work in the uh, manufacturing business or something like that, or they may have left Little Rock and went to California. Because a lot of people were going that way because they just sunshine or whatever drew them to California. But you will find that neighbors often move with some of your relatives. For instance, I have an uncle who left here in the 1950s and moved to Oakland, California. And as I did my research, not only did I find him there, but I found a couple of his classmates from his high school were living in the same area. And then as I dug deeper into some of the information I was looking for and the family history I was researching, I found out that before he went there, there was a generation above him that had gone out to California. And then there was a generation above that generation that had made the trip even earlier. So a lot of times when you find your relative in a certain area, look for other family members that have made may have gone in a generation or two generations before him or her and look for those relatives that may still be friends with the same family names that you're friends with at the location that did not leave that area. Um, some of us got to stay home and sometimes we stay home with some of the same family members and friends or next door neighbors that left here and moved to a different location back when they were traveling across the country and whatnot. <clears throat> you wanna look at labor skills? What kind of skills did your ancestor have? Um, and look at the time period they were living. From 1900 to 1960, a lot of the work that black women especially could do was domesticated work. So if that's their skill level, what kind of domesticated work were they doing? Was it laundry? Was it cooking? Was it midwife skills? What kind of skills did they have? And what were they doing? Where were they using those skills at? And then look at the generation before them and look at the generation after them to see if those same skills were used or expanded upon. Maybe they ended up opening a restaurant or something because of the skills that they had. Look to see what they had going on. And again, with the mobility, you wanna see who's moving where and why. Sometimes we move out of state and then we come back. Didn't like it or came home to have a baby and didn't go back, whatever the reason. <clears throat> What's the mobility in your family like? Right now, <laughs> I jokingly tell people that Texas is a suburb of Arkansas. And I know some of my Texas relatives may get upset with me about that. And like I say, I jokingly say it, but I really believe it. <laughs> because there's so many Arkansas people in Texas. But why are they going there? For jobs, a lot of times, uh, some of the rules and regulations of the, the area that may not be as strict as they are here, like where you can live or the mobility of you once you get into that area, the location of living. What's in common? What's the commonality for you there? Um, when you get to Texas, do you see people you know from Arkansas? Is that why you like it? Uh, do you find someone that uh, is competitive with you in the area of working? So basically you're, you're uh, competing for skill level. Uh, you're competing for uh, social aspects of life. Are you competing for uh, the uh, sports teams? Who's, who's got the best sports teams? you know, whatever. What's the commonality? What are you doing as far as letting folks know, hey, this is me, this is who I am, and I'm from Arkansas, and I still love the Dallas Cowboys, or whatever. Whatever the reason, what's the commonality? That helps you make your educated guess about whether or not your family member may have been engaged in a certain activity or engaged in a cer certain social set setting like church, Catholic church, 
Methodist church, Baptist church? What was it? Is it common in your family, on your family tree? Well, we all atheists on the, in the family tree. Find and make sure you understand if the evidence is there and make your educated guess about what's going on with that family. Next slide, please. Research is structured. I tell people all the time, my job is to answer questions. And I literally mean that. That's what I do all day, every day is answer questions. Sometimes the questions come out of my head. Sometimes they come from other folks. Sometimes they come by email. Sometimes they come by phone calls, but I'm answering questions most of the time. And sometimes when I'm answering that question, those questions, if I'm talking to someone and they're wanting me to help them with some research, I have to ask them questions. A lot of questions sometimes just to understand what question they are asking me to help them with. Because you may come in and say, I want to find out about my family when actually you just want to find out daddy's side of the family. Or you just want to find out about this relative that disappeared. Nobody knew what happened to him and you find out Oh, they went to New York and started in Broadway or whatever, but you're wanting to answer a question. And so the research will help you answer that question. And <laughs> so, so I laugh at myself a lot because this first statement organizing is personal. It really is. I am in my head, not an organizer, but the organizing I do is good for me. It helps me remember what I'm looking for and where I'm going with it and how to find what I'm looking for. So you can't tell me how to organize my thoughts. You can't tell me how to organize the information I've found on my family. That's up to me. Some people are good at technology, so they have everything on their computer. and They got all the trees printed out. They can print out because it's on their computer. And if they need to print it out, they can. And it's so neat and organized, where some people will stack up paper but you can't move a single sheet off that stack of paper because they will miss it. They will know what, was, what should have been there in that stack of paper or on the top of that stack of paper. That's their organizing habit. That's their organizing skill. It's personal. You do you, I'll do me. Sharing is personal. <laughs> I've been taking photographs of my family since I was a little kid, probably nine, 10 years old. And I'm in my 60s now, and they are definitely valuable to me, but they've also shown to be valuable to the rest of the family. Because uh, just a couple of months ago, I had a relative that passed, and he was kind of standoffish around the family, but I was the one that had photographs of him at different stages of his life. And so when he passed, I was able to share with his immediate family some of those photographs that I had when they put together a program for his um uh, Homegoing home service. So sharing is personal. I like to share <laughs> because I don't want to keep up with all this stuff. Now that I've collected it all these years, I have to find a way to use it. And so I will share it. Developing a documented record of your ancestral ties is a generational gift. And what I mean by that is if you take all the information you found on your family and you just hoard it for yourself. You just keep it to yourself. Oh, they don't want to know. Well, I put all this work together. I'm not going to share it with them. Well, first of all, it's not just yours. Yes, you did the work. Yes, you gathered it together. Yes, you put all this information in a user-friendly format, maybe. But the information does not just belong to you. Even if you are an only child, because if you go back one generation, was your parent also an only child? And if that's true, because there are some parents that were only children that only had one child, but go back another generation, were they only children? Probably not, uh, for a lot of different reasons. So the information you gathered is yours, but if you don't share it and you gathered all this information just for your own benefit, then you're losing out on a gift that you can give to future generations. Even if you don't want to share it with your family because you're mad at them, put it together, send it to the County Historical Society, or publish your own book about your family. Make sure a library gets a copy so it outlasts you and everybody else, but you left a, a trail for someone else, or you left a gift for someone else who may be a cousin 
to you twice removed because your great great grandparents were siblings and they find it and they have another look or another link to the family history that they have been looking for. So you want to look for that. You want to do that as a generational gift and placing your ancestors among their peers in a written format as the local, state, national, and world history. And I think it's the ultimate gift you can give to those that came before you because America is a very new country. <laughs> We're not very old. And if you're willing to look up all this information on your family and you're willing to write a narrative or publish a photograph explaining who these people are, then you're adding to the local, state, national, and world history. Because I personally believe Arkansas runs the world and nobody knows it yet because our greatest export has been our people. But when you start looking at the, the people that came through this place or the people that was born on this land called Arkansas, you find out what they did to assist the world in moving forward or what they did that was a, a, a revelation to others about how things could be done or what we could do to impress somebody or to bring joy to somebody's life, then we run the world. Whether it's musically, athletically, uh, academically, you, there's not a field of study that you cannot find someone connected to Arkansas in that has stood out. Um, somewhere we run the world our form our uh, our contacts are everywhere if you think about american history and what was going on at the time it was going on and think about your own family history when you're doing this kind of research and you're putting together that history think of the next generation or two generations away from you that may not even be born yet what a gift to them if when they get to school and you can tell them when they're studying the presidents, which one of your relatives was alive during the administration of that president. Right now, the whole world is focused on the United Kingdom. The queen has passed on. Most of us never knew anybody else other than Queen Elizabeth. So if you're talking to that grandchild or that great grandchild that has not been born yet and doing your collection of materials about your family, you find where you visited London, maybe in your 20s or 30s, and there was a photograph of you outside of Buckingham, Buckingham, Buckingham Palace, I'm getting tongue twisted, include that in your history because that family member that's not born yet or that's too young to understand what's going on would have a connection to this world event through you, through you. When they go farther back and they talk about the Civil War, connect that family member that, will, that was in your family tree, alive during the time of the Civil War, whether they served as a Civil War soldier or whether they were just living through that time period and su successfully lived through it long enough that you were created, you're here, then explain to that future generation how they connect to this piece of history. Because for me, when I think about the Civil War and I was never a military history person until I started working in this field at the library and realized that some of the oral history that I have been given, I could find documentations to prove. I was introduced to my grandmother. I was introduced to my grandmother's grandmother while sitting on the floor in my grandmother's bedroom. We would talk all the time and I get to ask her questions and I ask her about her grandmother because she was my favorite person, my grandmother was. And so naturally I want to know if she remembered her grandmother and she did. And the, de the details that she gave me about her grandmother's life led me to do a little bit more research. And I found out, well, she was, she was alive during the time of the Civil War. So I started looking at what was going on around her. First of all, how old was she during the Civil War? Well, when it started, she was eight. When it ended, she was 12. And so I had that information. And then I started looking a little deeper. And I found out, well, I knew that she had grown up around Moralton, Arkansas. Well, Lewisburg, Arkansas is at the tip of the uh, Moralton. It's very close to Moralton. 
it was a city at one point, it's not so much now, just a little spot on the map, but my grandmother's grandmother was living in Lewisburg during the time of the Civil War. Turns out it was a major battle during the Civil War around Lewisburg, Arkansas. So I'm able to connect the Civil War personally to information I learned about my grandmother's grandmother while sitting at the knee of my grandmother. And that information will be shared to future generations because I've written it down in a location where they can find it and I will share it with them or they will stumble across it when I'm gone from here. But the information is out there to share my perspective of meeting my grandmother's grandmother at my grandmother's house and then relating the facts that I knew from my grandmother to the history that I found in the books and documents in the public library. So again, you wanna find the research. Research is what you do and writing about that research, connecting that research to your family, connecting it to today, connecting it to yesterday, connecting it to the future is our goal because you, you can do the best thing by leaving that gift of information for generations to come after you. No matter who thinks you're crazy right now for gathering that stuff, ain't nobody gonna read it, I don't wanna know. They may find out later that they do want to know. They do want to know what that information is, where you found it. And sometimes they want to look just to prove you wrong. And I, I accept that challenge with my relatives. Prove me wrong that I don't know what I'm talking about. We can do that all day long. So with you, when you're doing that research, do it with laughter, do it with joy, do it with gusto, but find that evidence, publish that evidence, and give it to your family to debate. The holidays are coming up. Let them argue with you over stuff you can prove and they may not be able to prove. They may say, nah, grandmama didn't like that kind of cake. She liked this kind of cake. Well, their memory may be wrong or maybe grandma liked both kinds of cake. And with you, she had one kind and with your cousin, she had a different kind. That was y'all's cake together or, or whatever. But the thing is you cannot dispute the hard evidence. Grandma was born on this day. She died on this day. In between, she got married to this man or this man and this man and this man and this man. Doesn't matter. It's her story. It's how she lived. How many children did she have? You can prove that on a lot of records. A lot of the census records, especially the early census records, if you're looking at the female in the household and she's the spouse or the partner of the head of the household, a lot of times in that 1900, 1910, 1920, 1930 census, it might actually tell you how many children she gave birth to and how many are still alive. That's a record that is hard evidence. Uh, talking earlier about my grandmother's grandmother, I found one record where Mariah, according to her, because she gave the information to the census taker, gave birth to 13 children. Well, the only evidence I found that any of those children lived to an adult, to be an adult, was that one child who is the reason why I'm here. And it looks like she grew up as an only child because there, I found no other records mentioning any other children other than the fact that Mariah said on one record she had given birth to 13 children and only one was living. And so that's enough evidence for me to think that maybe those other children did not survive past infancy or childhood, and most did not have any children that we know of. But this one child survived, and because of her, there are hundreds of us around right now. So I'm thankful for that. And so when you're looking at your relatives again, understand their story, understand what they had to deal with during that time period. What are, what are the odds, odds today that someone would give birth to 13 children and only one of them would survive to adulthood. They're very small because we have medical advances. We have uh, things that will help us predict whether or not that child is viable. And a lot of times, even the sickest child can be brought into the world and given life-sustaining medical attention and live for decades. So again, when we're doing our research, we make, make sure we know what's going on around the time that, that person is living, what was happening in their life, what, what, what did they have access to medically, uh, physically, emotionally, what was going on. And so when you're doing your research, you get to decide how to organize it, 
you decide how to share it, but you do want to continue to do the research and add to the information that you have compiled and share that information, not just with the people that are alive today, but with the people that may come two or three generations down the line looking for that same family and you get to talk to them. You get to talk to them through your writing or through your posting of a photograph in a county historical journal or in a state historical journal or uh, just online through Find a Grave or something like that. Do it, share it, and uh, let folks fight about what you get because you got the evidence, you got the proof, make them find where you're wrong. Uh, and a lot of times, they will confirm what you've already found as far as your research. So with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'd like to see if you all have any questions for me and uh, we can go from there. Jake, uh, what's that? Somebody in the chat? Okay, so we do, we have some questions in the chat. Um, one person asked if it's gonna be recorded and available online. And yes, it is. Um, it's being recorded. It'll be put up online and then everybody will get an email with that link. It's part of our YouTube channel. Um, and there's older versions of Finding Family Facts on our YouTube channel right now. And I will be able to, um, as soon as I stop sharing my screen, I'll be able to send you a link directly to that page as well. So yeah, if you have a question for Rhonda, um, feel free to either type it in the chat or um, you can come online and just start talking. Good website for doing research. Yeah. Yes, there are some good websites for doing research. Understand that everything is not online yet, but the if you're looking at television on a regular basis, you get bombarded with Ancestry Library or Ancestry uh, commercials. Ancestry is the number one database that's used most often. Um, it's very good. It's very easy to use. And yeah, the machine behind Ancestry will give you hints or leads to other information, but you still have to verify the evidence because sometimes the machine is wrong and there are two people with the same name in two different locations. And sometimes those names get mangled or, or the machine thinks they're the same person. So you do have to do some backup research to make sure you, you're following the right person in that in that family tree. But Ancestry, I would say, is the number one database that most people use. There is a free data, and Ancestry, like Heather said earlier, is available through our library, through all our branches, but most libraries have a subscription to Ancestry. So if you have not checked with your local library, do that. If they do not have it, ask them to get it because you pay taxes and they should want to do something for you because you are the patron. Uh, so Ancestry, again, is that number one. Uh, family Search, I would think, is very close second, if not even with Ancestry. Family Search is out of Salt Lake City, Utah. It is a free database, uh, Family Search is, and uh, they've got enough volunteers now that they're adding material all the time, daily, that will help you with your research. And uh, like I said, they're growing pretty fast. And so they're competitive with Ancestry. Heritage Quest is a database you can use from home if you are with the Central Arkansas Library System. And all you need is the uh, 16 digits on the back of your library card to access that. Go to the library's homepage, go to, uh, I think it's learning, and then databases, and then pull up Heritage Quest or Fold3. Those are two databases that the library allows you to use off-site. So no matter what time of the day or night you want to do your research, if you have a library card with our system, you can do it from home, some of that, by going to Heritage Quest and Fold3. Fold3 is also one of those databases with a lot of military records. And so even if you don't suspect your family had any military ties because nobody wants to serve in the military today or nobody thinks the military is worthy to serve in today, do your research, go back in time and see if any of your ancestors either had to register for a draft actually enlisted and served at some point in time in our American history in the military. You'll find that, that relative a lot of times. Uh, the National Archives and Records Administration is another database that's useful when you're doing uh, family history research. And it is the official 
records of the government of the United States of America. They are constantly adding to databases that we can access. Like I know for a fact, real soon, hopefully, and I say real soon, I'm usually talking in the next year to two years, there will be more information about women that served in our military because those uh, records are starting to be digitized and added in on the National Archives and Records Administration format. Um, a lot of people, well, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but a lot of people. <laughs> Some people don't realize just how many women served during the Civil War. But women did serve during the Civil War. Some women even drew pensions during the Civil War. And so eventually, hopefully, you'll be able to find out if one of your ancestors was one of those female that served during the Civil War. Uh, there's a story, there's been a book, there's been a couple of minor movies, I think, about her. There's a lady named Kathy Williams. Kathy Williams changed her name to William Kathy and enlisted in the Civil War as a soldier in Little Rock, Arkansas. Uh, she actually was a cook for the, in the, in, during the Civil War, and afterwards she became a Buffalo soldier. And she was a good soldier until she got sick and they realized she was a female and not a male and she was disposed of as far as her position. She ended up moving to Denver, Colorado area and running a grocery store or something out there. And I believe she's buried out there. But Kathy Williams became William Kathy and served as a Buffalo soldier. And she started her service in Little Rock, Arkansas. So you'll find stories like that. And like I said, with the more records that are coming online, you just have to go back from time to time and check for the updates on all of these databases. Like Ancestry, if you go to uh, their front page, there's a link that says, uh, I think it's new and updated databases is the title of it. If you click on that, it will give you a list of everything that they've added or updated in the last few weeks. And of course, there's new stuff coming online all the time. Um, those are the major databases that you want to look at. But there are other things that you can also look at, like uh, the state of Virginia has started adding uh, databases that includes a list of people who used to be slaves. Because slavery was a business, you want to look at it from the business aspect of it. Of what are the records that, that are created during the business? And so there are a list of people who had been enslaved because you had to pay taxes on them. And sometimes um, those records are available through one of the colleges in, in uh, Virginia or through the State Archives of Virginia. So you wanna check uh, State Archives around the country just to see what they have online. Um, the Arkansas State Archives here in Little Rock has quite a few records online that we may not have because they've been collecting and they've been in existence a lot longer than I, I, uh, our business has, the library's genealogy department has. So you wanna check with organizations like that. You also wanna look at uh, old newspapers um, one of the biggest databases I've seen lately, and I'm, I'm waiting on them to get a little bit easier to use because I forget the name of it when I found it, but um, there's a database being compiled that puts together the names of a lot of people that were listed as runaways uh, during slavery time. And so those names come up, and even though it may just be a first name, there may be clues around the area that they were at. Uh, living in or they ran away from. There's also records being created of uh, all the advertisements after the Civil War where people were looking to reconnect with their families that have formed, that had been formerly enslaved. And so they're looking for my mother who was described as such and such person or she went by the name of Ann or something like that. And so a lot of times you can find those records. They're coming online. But again, it's a slow process because digitizing and, and, and getting all that information in a user-friendly format takes time and it takes uh, people power. And so just because we want it right now, doesn't mean it's gonna be out there right now. So be patient. It's still coming out, more stuff is coming, but those are some of the databases that you can use. Uh, if you're looking for someone that was born in the fifties or late forties and you don't find them on a census record, maybe they're in a rural area somewhere, there are records that you can use to connect them to the people in the generation before them. There's one database that I use all the time. It's called Family Tree Now. Family Tree Now is a public records database. Um, so if you got a light bill in your name, 
if you got a voter registration card in your name, you're going to show up in that Family Tree Now database. And what I like about the Family Tree Now, other than strictly for stalkers, no, Family Tree Now gives you the name of the person you're looking for in the city that you believe they're in. And then it, if you click on that name, it's going to tell you possible relatives and possible associates. It's going to give you telephone numbers, whether it's a landline, landline or a cell phone number. It's going to give you um, addresses, sometimes which helps confirm, oh, they're still in the family house. And so you can connect today's people that are alive with generations that were alive before them. Because sometimes we use the same addresses because the house was air property, or we use the same uh, bill information because if grandma had a water bill in her name in the 1930s, and you still getting water at that house in her name, a lot of times you're not going to change that for sentimental reasons or for practical reasons or whatever. So it helps you connect to a different generation if you're using Family Tree now, because it will, uh, for instance, uh, you lived in your grandmother's house and grandmother been gone 20 years. It still may show grandmother's name when you pull up your name because you connected to her and you will shared some information that was publicly known. And so those two names are still placed together. So those are some of the databases that you can look for. Just get creative. Uh, there's no right or wrong way to do research. You just got to find the evidence that you're looking for that proves what you're trying to prove. That this person existed. This is who they're connected to. This is what happened to them. And this is where they came from as early as I can find any evidence of them living. And so, again, a lot of those databases are, are updated on a regular basis. So check back if you hadn't checked a certain database in a couple of weeks, then go back to it. If you hadn't checked it in a year, definitely go back to it because it's been updated. Rhonda, I just put in the chat, if people don't live in our service area, which is Cal's service area is Pulaski and Perry County, Arkansas, but not North Little Rock, um, you can actually pay $54 a year and get a Cal's library card. That's cheaper than most property tax. So um, if, if you want access to our databases, I still think you should check, you know, check with your local library. Most likely they're going to have um, the same databases we have. They're going to have heritage quests. They're going to have ancestry. They're going to have newspapers because genealogy um, is a big deal for libraries. It's one of the things that most of us have really kind of sunk our teeth into. Um, so, but you can, if you, um, and you get lots of other things, lots of other benefits for that $54 a year. Um, but I just wanted to tell everybody that. I also put in the, the chat, the link to Family Tree Now. Um, and then we've got a couple of questions. We've got um, a real deep, good one. Um, Kay Cook says, I can't locate my second great grandfather's parents. He was born in the early 1800s. We think he may have been either born out of wedlock or his parents passed and he was raised by someone other than his parents. Any ideas on where to look? He was born in Tennessee according to his Civil War veteran records. Yeah. That's are we common. assuming this is our cake? Is this a white person? I'm assuming, because that's a whole nother. Yeah. Yes, white. Okay, white male. There's a good chance he wasn't raised by his parents. If you don't find the parents in that early records, the problem with the time period that he was born, if he was born in the early 1800s. The Civil War started in 61, 1861. So if he was born in the early 1800s, he probably did not participate in the Civil War. But because you have a Civil War record on him and you're pretty sure that's your ancestor, then the good chance, there's a good chance he was born around 1820 to 1840 if he participated in the Civil War. And so you wanna look for records during that time period in the area uh, where you think he grew up as a matter of fact, the speaker we're having October the 1st, her focus is on the southeastern states. And so I suspect she will have a lot more information than I can give you on this. But <clears throat> you want to look for anyone with that first name. And I know it could be a common first name like William. But find out how many Williams 
uh, William R. or whatever his initials were, are in that area that would have been born between 1820 and 1840 that could have participated in the Civil War in 18, well, actually, yeah, in 1861. So you wanna look for someone that would have been prime fighting age, like between 18 and 40, to have served during that war. Also get as many of his Civil War records as you can get, and you can write the National Archives and Records Administration for that, because on those records, it will give you details, especially if he drew a pension, they give you details about his life. It may even give you the names of his parents. Um, that costs a little money, but it's worth the investment if you know for a fact that that's your ancestor and that's his Civil War record. Then file for that record, the expanded record, uh, what they call the military jacket, because it will give you many more details, not just about uh, his promotions or non-promotions during the service, but it may also tell you uh, who was his contact if something happened to him or look for local newspaper articles that may have included him in it. Look through some of the government records to see if maybe he got some kind of award during that time period or after the Civil War. Look for um, that first census after the Civil War. See where he is. See what his occupation is. See who's around him. Uh, was he born in the same state? that he was in in 1870. And if so, that narrows down your search. Uh, the state of Tennessee does not have as much online as I would like, because being in Arkansas, there are many of us who have a leg or, or ancestral leg in Tennessee. And so being able to dig through some of those records would be very useful for us. But in the meantime, if you know, like he was in uh, the Knoxville area, find a contact at that library, send them a question. They may be able to do some limited research. And I say limited because most libraries do not have uh, dozens of researchers or dozens of people to help answer your questions. But the staff that's at the library would do as much as they can to help you find the answers that you're looking for concerning your genealogy. <coughs> she says in here, she added a comment, uh, Rhonda, that he was born in 1821 in Sylvan County, in Sylvan County. Yes, I said that right. I sounded okay. funny coming out of my stopped up face. Um, Tennessee, and that is that is Knoxville, Bristol, Johnson City. That is that is that corner of Tennessee where Lori is from. So, yeah. Kay, if you live locally <laughs> or if you can attend the Zoom. Um, genealogy workshop I would highly recommend that and also if he was land owning you might look at um there's a fabulous government website for landowners um especially it's really good for pre-civil war um so if he owned any kind of land whether it be a homesteader's plot or larger pieces of land um I'll put that in the chat as well Um, our next question is, and I think you and I both have different answers to this. How do you organize your data? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> no. But um, if you move a piece of her paper, she knows it. Yeah. Um, Everybody is different in how they organize. Like I say, some people prefer to do it digitally on the computer. Some people prefer the paper. Um, and this, I can't say either way is better than the other, it's, it's personal. What do you like to do? <clears throat> Personally for me, if I can look at it, hold it in my hand, go back to it a time or two, then I may actually see something I didn't see earlier. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so. I'm, I'm making you cough through the through the technology. Oh, uh, no. Okay, I'll take it. You, I'm going to mute you and you take over. You, you cough for a second. Um, so I will say that the way I do, re the way I organize my research is very, I mean, Rhonda is definitely a paper person. I am more digital. Um, for years, I used a thing called Evernote. Um, and recently, I got kind of frustrated with the platform, um, it was not doing what I wanted. 
and I was paying for it. And I think we've all probably had those moments where you're like, well, I'm not gonna pay for this anymore. So I've switched, um, I'm a Mac person. So I've switched to Apple notes and I keep everything organized in there. Um, anytime I download something from ancestry, I make a new note and I put information in there. Um, it could be better, but I can search it and find things that, um, you know, different information for different people. So that's what, so I'm, I do the technology stuff, Rhonda prints it out, um, but both systems work. I used to be a big fan of the three ring binder, right? Like three ring binders for each person. And I had tons of them. Um, and then I scanned them all in eventually, but so that's, that's how I organize my stuff. Okay, Rhonda, I'm going to see if you can unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay. okay. So I like the paper part but I also use some digital because I'm reluctant to, but it is organized in a way that I understand it. <clears throat> and it's for me so that I can present in written format, like to my family members or uh, to one of the county journals, what I've learned about my family. And so the narrative that I compose from <clears throat> the evidence that I found through all these databases and in my paperwork that I've printed out and kept, I can use it to build my narrative for what I'm telling. And so once I've done that and I have a written format, like an article or a book or my thesis, then I don't need all the paper anymore and I can recycle or do what I need to do with it. But I have the finished product with the evidence for people, the footnotes and whatnot for people to go back and confirm what I found or argue with me about what I found and say, well, you got the wrong person. I'm like, nah, I got the right person. So again, when it comes to organizing, it's what's best for you. How do you do it? Uh, do you put all your shoes in a shoe closet or do you just lay them anywhere in the living room? You know, so like siblings, two siblings that have two different ways. Um, I still think about my little sister I'm glad I don't live with her anymore because literally growing up, we shared a room and her side would be just as junky and unorganized and full of dust because I refuse to dust her side anymore. And on a hardwood floor, you can see the edge of the dust and the clean part. And so my side was always clean because I wasn't getting in trouble for her. Her side was always dirty. <laughs> so that's another way to look at it. How do you want to organize yours? Now she's um, the cleanest person around. <laughs> <laughs> there's some follow-up questions to that um let's see Megan wants to know about what about PC um Megan there is well I know Microsoft has a thing called OneNote um I'm I will find out I I apologize for not knowing I just I really live in a PC in a Mac world completely um and then Kay also asks again is um Apple Notes free and or where do you find it? Yeah, Apple Notes is free. It comes, it's one of the kind of standard features on any phone um, or any Mac. It's, um, it used to be called <coughs> Note um, and it is a little icon. I was gonna, they've really upgraded it in the last couple of um, incarnations. I don't know if you can see, but it's that little, yellow banner with the kind of looks like a piece of paper um and you can have you have all kinds of folders oops oh that's not gonna work so i'm working on um two programs for hopefully for the spring um one about creating your own website to post your genealogy so that all the world can um can see and then one about kind of technology and organizing your notes. So that's coming, but I will find out about the PC um, part of it. Let's see. Also, Heather, <clears throat> if, there, if you're planning to attend our October 1st genealogy workshop, our speaker, Laura Thornton, is, uh, was using virtual classes before the pandemic and teaching uh, genealogy and other subjects from the college she works with, I believe. And so she would be one to ask about all of these questions. And I will make sure I communicate with her and tell her that um, we've had some questions like that about what's the best format 
to keep up with uh, information digitally for those that are doing ancestry research. And Natalie says that she just learned about, and I, I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right, Zotero, Zotero. And I've heard about that too. And I've looked into it and it's really cool. There's also something called Airtable that I think you do have to pay for. I mean, there is, there are so many data collecting platforms out there for all kinds of devices. It's really kind of overkill. Um, so, but yes, I, Natalie, I've seen that one and I like that one and it is free. Um, okay, let's see. There was a question up here from Deir Deirdre. She says, I can't find my great grandfather named Squire Bishop. What a great name, right? Uh, Squire Bishop. Um, the Squire is a common name also. And well, say she says some say square. That's even better. Square Bishop, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, any info on the name Squire? Frustrated, I can't easily find him. His father was John and his sister was Ruth. <clears throat> yeah, um, you're going to find a name misspelled, mispronounced, all kinds of things. Uh, but you want to narrow it down to someone who is born around the same year that you know your ancestor was born. And uh, he may have used that name legally in a couple of records, but then he may be called Bob in the rest. But again, you want to look for someone with that same family grouping of names. Uh, like if you found him as a child with his siblings and parents, then you want to look for all those people and what happened to them, where did they go, who were they living around. Again, when you're looking at a census record, especially for an adult, and you know as a child they lived in this certain area like Plaston County, Arkansas, my folks are in since the late 1800s. But when I go look for my relatives in Plaster County, Arkansas, I also look for neighbors that I knew were associated with the family, like the surnames that I knew were associated with my family or that may have married into my family. Because sometimes the mistakes that are made <clears throat> by humans on the census record are really simple to understand why they made that mistake. Uh, they forgot to add a last name when they went to the next house or something. So you'll find them combined with another household or the machine thought it was all one household when it was two households. So sometimes the mistakes are by our own hand. Sometimes it's because we did not actually look at the record we were looking at or we made a mistake transcribing that record. But if you're looking for someone that you can only find on one or two records, you wanna look for someone in as close to that age as possible with the same surname the same gender, or you want to look for someone who fathered a child that you know is on your family tree, or who was a mother to a child that you know is on your family tree, or was a grandparent, or an aunt, or an uncle to a child that you know is on your family tree. You just want to expand your search to look for other places they could be living other than with their immediate family. Um, if they were in school, did they go away to school and live with relatives or friends of the family? Uh, did they come back home? Did they join the military afterwards? What happened? Um, just imagine yourself at that age, uh, especially if they're a young person, 18 to 30 years old. Where would you have been? What would you have done? Because a lot of times what we think of ourselves or how we would uh, relate our, our own situation to someone in the past, a lot of times it's not very far off. I mean, there's that saying, there's nothing new under the sun. We do the same things. We have the same habits as our ancestors had. They just had different toys to play with than we have. So you want to look for them in the area. You want to look for somebody that uh, may be known only as a nickname. For instance, my grandfather's father we all, I always thought his name was Noxie Toombs because that's what I was told. Noxie was his name, Toombs was his last name. Not true. Noxie was his middle name. His first name was Edward, but I've only found one record where he actually used it. His name was Edward. But my grandfather only knew as Willie, and his name was not Willie. When he was born, his name was Willis. He was named after an uncle. So sometimes 
the variation in spelling or the nickname is what's stuck. And the name that you're looking for is actually out there on a record somewhere, but because they only used it once or twice, it'd be a hard time for you to find it. But you want to look for those hard evidence records, like that birth or the marriage or the death record where we'll probably give uh, the correct legal name of the person you're looking for. Or military records. Military records are really good for verifying what a person's name is. Because when the military writes it down, that's your name. <laughs> so even if you just had initials LC, the military is going to give you a name like Leonard Charles. Like, where do you get Leonard Charles from? Oh, he joined the military and they gave him a name. His name was LC. Like, I've seen records where twins were born and named A and B, but that's not the name they ended up at, with as adults. <laughs> and that was legally their name at birth, A and B. <laughs> Um, let's see, Megan asks, how specifically do you validate a potential piece of data? Well, for me, I have to be 90 to 100% sure that this is the right person because names are duplicates. And even though we think we're unique sometimes in naming our children, you may not be the only one that had that thought and it may come out the same way. Um, like today, we, I would say Zenobia is not a common name. I went to high school with a Zenobia. I went to elementary school with a Zenobia, two different people. But Zenobia was a very common name in the early 1900s. So you will find lots of Zenobias out there. Um, like the name Squire or Square. Either one of those were very popular in the late 1800s, mid to late 1800s. Colors were popular for names for men. You find a lot of men named Orange. You find a lot of men named Pink, short for Pinkney sometimes, but a lot of times they were just Pink, and women named Pink also. Uh, you found Green as a common name for men. And uh, like, where did that come from? All the colors of the coloring box or something. But you will find those examples of names. And it, it's, it's like now, what's the popular name for babies? If you think about <clears throat> living today, there's a whole lot of people named Taylor and a whole lot of people named Jordan, male and female, that were named during the late 80s, early 90s, early 2000s, during that time period. But today, there are so many of them. How do we distinguish which one is which? By the gender, by the age, approximately the year they were born. But yeah, they're duplicates any way you look at it uh, in, in either gender for those names. And so when you're doing your research, you have to look at the time period they were living in and uh, do, do a little digging. You can actually find out what, what were the popular names during the decade of life that person was living, the first decade of their life. What was the popular names for people in that area or people in that state or people in the country at that time period? And then uh, you can always start with the date of death and go backwards, try to go backwards. But if you verify that date of death and like you have an obituary or you know for a fact that death certificate says this was their name, then you can build on that because there's some clue, some clue on that death certificate that will lead you to the earliest record possible for that person. Yeah, I, I always think of names coming in clusters. Yeah. Like, you know, my mom's name is Phyllis and her sister was Linda and they were both born in the late 40s. There are so many Phyllises and Lindas born in the late 40s, early 50s. It's insane. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, you can, you can kind of tell when someone was born. I'm a Heather. There's a lot of us. I was born in 1974. There's a ton of us born in the 70s. It was a big name. So, um, yeah, clusters of names. Um, Kay asks, do you do much with DNA specifically why DNA for genealogy? It looks like both my parents' surnames have not, have no Y DNA matches. I actually do not do a lot with that. <clears throat> um, I do basic genealogy for one, and I have not had as much time to concentrate on the DNA section of uh, genealogy because I'm busy answering questions about the basic stuff for folks. But I have taken the test. I haven't looked at my results in a while, but uh, there are people out there that would assist you 
if you have not joined a genealogical society, like here in Little Rock, there's the Heritage Seekers, there's the uh, Arkansas Genealogical Society, there's the uh, Afro-American Genealogical and Historical Society, an organization like that. And there's smaller ones like county organizations. If you have not joined one, think about it, uh, contact them because as a group, sometimes there's someone in that group that can assist you faster than someone at your local public library because they've either done it, done what you're looking for, or they have a clue as to how to best get the information you're looking for. If you have not attended a national genealogical organization's workshop, I encourage you to plan on doing that also because there's nothing like being preach pandemic in a room with two to 3,000 people that are all doing the same thing you're doing, but they all have different ways of, of managing what they're doing or, how, or researching what they're doing. And they can give you a clue that you hadn't thought of, that I hadn't thought of, that would be most useful to you. Uh, the idea is to social network in those organizations to find clues that will help you. And uh, again, there's someone with more knowledge than me, always is, uh, any way you look at it. <clears throat> but just getting into those avenues of information with other people that are doing the same thing that you're doing may help you with your own research. Uh, I learn from others just like you all do. I just put in the chat the link to the program we did last summer with um, Shannon Christmas. Oh, yeah. um, it was all about DNA. And he was our, so during COVID, we did online genealogy workshops. And so this was three hours where he just talked about, I mean, it was more science than I had had since high school. Um, and so it's in, that link is in the chat. You can also go to our YouTube channel and search Shannon Christmas. That's his name and it'll pop up. So, and, and do find somebody because the folks that do the DNA, they, they know what they're talking about. And it's a group all to themselves. It They're is. Exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> um, you spell his name. I'm going to type it, but it's just, it's Shannon, S-H-A-N-N-O-N, -N -N, and Christmas, just like the holiday. And that is really, we, he tells the story, how he got that name, I think, in the, yeah. in the so. I think that's all the questions we have all right. in the chat. I thank you all for participating. Thank you for the questions. Thank you for doing your research. Continue working on it and share it. I mean, we got to build our own history. This is America. And please join us October 1st, whether you are in person here in Little Rock with us at the Ron Robinson Theater or you are joining us via Zoom, I think Lori is gonna have a fabulous program. Um, yeah. So please join us for that. And we're here every month, except next month um, with Finding Family Facts. But we also have personal archiving. And we, I don't think we've said it this time. I don't think you've said it this time, Rhonda, but the best place to start is to come to Robert's library and to talk with Rhonda and to get started that way. That is the best way um, to work on your genealogy. So come visit us. And check with your local library if you're not in this area. Send them an email, send them a question. They may be able to assist you that way. But be patient because we get questions all day long from all over. So <laughs> Kay Cook says it's a it's a bit away in Wyoming. So we have someone yeah. from Wyoming, um, but she would love to come. Well, at some point, take a road trip. Fourth, you know, Interstate 40 comes right through <laughs> Little Rock. And you gotta, you know, you gotta take it. So um, come visit us, but but do join us virtually. Um, we love seeing people from far away. And when you find that Arkansas uh, relative, definitely come see us because we can show you where they were living and how they were living. And we got cookbooks from the 1800s that may be useful in letting you know exactly what they were eating. <laughs> so Megan asks, what class did you say for getting started? So this class is great for getting started on genealogy. We also have a personal archiving class for um, organizing your own personal records, photos, and things like that. Um, that's That will be Thursday at 3.30. Um, 
and that's really and then there's the oh then there's the genealogy workshop which will be october 1st and that should be back at the top of the chat oh and i forgot to mention and danielle will be mad at me if i don't the this this thursday that's the 15th right yes this thursday at 6 30 we are going to do a capturing your hispanic heritage just kind of it is two white girls talking about hispanic heritage so it's not next year we're going to have somebody who actually is from mexico to come and speak but it's going to be what resources we have and how you can find those resources to do any kind of hispanic heritage um let's see and then Kay says can we find all the information on the top of the chat what i'll do Kay, is i will um i will post all of that in the email when i send you the link when i send everybody the link to this i will post what i put in the chat okay all right happy monday happy monday everybody See you later. Bye. Bye.